Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Looped In with Maritza. My name is Maritza Gertie, the National Parents Union Northeast Region Organizer. I hope that everyone has had an enjoyable first part of this week. And I hope that you continue to have an enjoyable rest of this week. Um, as you know, every time I open the show, I open up with some announcements, um, some opportunities. This information, um, I'll be copying and pasting into the chat of, 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 of this program as we're talking. So I'm just going to go down the list. And as I'm talking, I'll be copying and pasting. So please excuse me if you see me looking down a little bit on my phone. Um, as you can see, I'm not in my regular space. I'm once again broadcasting live from an alternate location, um, but let's start. Uh, families, those of you that are interested in seeing what it is that we do and what we discuss when it comes to educational equity, educational justice, and making sure that all of our children receive the education that they deserve and that it should absolutely be a civil right for all children, attending school of uh, the National Parents Union Northeast Virtual Meetup will be September 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be providing the link to register. That is the only way you will be able to be a part of it. It will not be something that is streamed live on any social media platform. Um, school will begin on Tuesday, August 31st for all the children that attend school at the Philadelphia School District. So it will be this coming Tuesday they will be starting school. Um, by now, you should have already been told what your child's schedule will be in the event that it has changed from what it was in previous years or last school year. Also, please be reminded, anyone that has children that are entering kindergarten, the first full week of school will be half days. So hopefully you have been informed of this and are able to make arrangements for your little kinders. I have two myself getting ready to start on Tuesday and they are so very, very excited. Families, the um, Teach Truth Campaign Weekend of Action will be this Friday through Sunday, August 27th through the 29th. Let's show our support, be a part of it in your state. I'm going to include the link where you can click on it and get information on where and what time this action will take place in your community. Currently, there are 43 communities that will be participating in this weekend's action. Uh, if you do participate in the action, make sure you take a lot of pictures and post it on your social media, hashtag teach truth. This is a campaign that is focused on making sure that our teachers are supported, our teachers that want to make sure that they continue to teach the truth to our children and not be stifled or gagged or feel any kind of pressure of any type of retaliation for teaching our children the truth. They would really love to see families that are in full support of this. So please uh, go on. I'm going to put the link for the website, the Zend Project Organization, and all the on there it will detail all the locations, cities, towns, and times of where the actions will be taking place this weekend across the country. If you're feeling sick or visiting family, um, COVID testing will be done at El Concilio at 141 East Hunting Park Avenue in Philadelphia. That's Front and Hunting Park every Thursday in September. So it's September 2nd, 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You do not need to have insurance. You do not need to make an appointment. But family, you must make sure that you are comfortable with using the nasal swab on your own or bring someone with you that will do it for you and you'll be able to have a test result in 15 minutes. It's free, no insurance needed. Please go and get yourselves tested. Um, Chromebook support families of children that attend school district of Philadelphia schools, they will, there is still support going on every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., as well as Wednesdays from 9 to 5. The locations are South Philadelphia High School, 2101 South Broad Street, Fitzpatrick Annex Building at 4101 Chalfont Drive in the Northeast, and um, up in the Mount Airy area, Martin Luther King High School at 6100 Stenton Avenue. So if you have an issue with a damaged Chromebook, a cracked Chromebook, a lost charger, 
If, if you need one, make sure you know your child's student ID number. Go there now before Tuesday. You have today till Friday and Monday of next week. Get your child's Chromebook. Take that Chromebook from out that closet, out that box, wherever you had it over the, over the summer. Look at it, power it up, make sure it's charged, make sure it turns on. And if it does not, take it there as soon as possible to make sure you get it, have it ready for your baby in the event they have to use it in the future. So just get it done. Um, there is a strict, short, a very serious shortage of school bus drivers. So Holcomb, H-O-L-C-O-M-B, is looking for school bus and mini draft, mini van drivers. You can reach out to them at drive for the number four holcomb.com. They're offering a sign-on bonus. They're offering benefits. They're paying $22 an hour. There is a need for that across the city of Philadelphia, if you're interested. There are many, 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 many back to school giveaways happening in and around the city of Philadelphia. Um, August 27th, a back to school book bag giveaway at Lucian E. Blackwell Library, 52nd and Sampson. On Friday, August 27th, a back to school book bag giveaway and supplies sponsored by the Camden Coalition in Camden, New Jersey on River Road, 3213 at Miguel's Pharmacy. Miguel's Pharmacy in Camden, New Jersey on River Road. This Friday, first come, first serve, you must bring your child from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for school supplies. The fifth annual back to school free backpacks and, and school supplies giveaway, Sunday, September 12th, 1854 North 22nd Street. It's gonna be happening at the corner of 22nd and Burks. Please go there and show your support. It will also be first come first serve while supplies last. Um, there's also going to be a giveaway, a back to school giveaway, August 27th. Uh, please make sure you would go over to 2506 North Front Street. Children must be present in order to have them be able to receive a free book bag and school supplies. I'm going to post all this information on the National Parents Union Northeast regional page, as well as in the chat. So if, any, if I missed anything, the pictures will all be there. Go to the National Parents Union Northeast region Facebook page, join it, like it. Anyone that's interested in being a member of the National Parents Union, I've said this in the past, www.nationalparentsunion.org. It is free to become a member, whether it's an individual or an organization. That's my community output for the day for everybody. Um, allow me please to now bring on my guest today so that uh, we can have a conversation. And if anybody has any questions about anything, please feel free to put it in the chat, questions, comments, and I'll, and I'll try to you know make sure I look down on my phone. Please excuse me, I'm not gonna be rude. Look down on my phone to then look at it and acknowledge the question. Thank you so much. Welcome. How's it going? How are you today? Ah, uh, doing good. Doing good. Doing Halfway good. through this week. Yep. Halfway through this week. Please introduce yourselves for anyone that may not know you. I doubt it, but for anyone that may not know you, please introduce yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Ishmael Jimenez. Um, I have been a teacher in uh, school district of Philadelphia for the past twelve years. Um, recently became the social studies curriculum specialist for the school district. Um, a father of four boys uh, who go to Philadelphia public schools, two to Lingelbach, one at uh, SLA Middle School, and the other one going into high school, uh, to the youth school. Um, I'm also uh, involved in many uh, organizations throughout the city that fight for racial and social justice, uh, groups like uh, Black Lives Matter Philly, uh, the Philly chapter of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, um, and racial justice organizing committee. Um, and all this is just really to blur the lines of the work that I do professionally and the work that needs to be done for uh, our communities and our children. Well, first, I want to thank you for what you do. Um, being a teacher, you know, we're, we're all 
we're all teachers to our children from the time they're born. So that is something that, although some, some parents might say, I don't, I don't know how to teach, I'm not a teacher. I was like, yes, you are. If you taught your child how to walk, talk, you know, tie their shoes, uh, make a meal, uh, put on a coat, button up a button, zipper, zipper, you're a teacher. But what you and so many others have chosen to do is answer to a calling that, that asks you to educate more than just your own. You're educating other people's children. And for that, I wanna thank you and everybody out there that's a teacher. So for many people, for many educators, school has already started, uh, depending on where they live in this part, in, in this country, it started back in, you know, earlier this month. Um, in Philadelphia is gonna start next week. Um, a lot of things are happening very quickly. A lot of things that we we sort of saw coming down the pipe as far as a possibility, but there are also now all these new concerns, because I don't, I'm not gonna call them complaints. They're concerns and legitimate concerns that people have regarding back to school. So how have you prepared yourself as a parent, but also as an educator for the onslaught of full five-day instruction for our children? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of strange because, you know, the way they talk about the cases rising right now seems similar for the same reason why they shut it down last time around. Um, of course, there's always that semblance of, of concern. Um, you know, I was home all since, you know, la last March through the rest of the year with my four sons doing virtual while I was working virtual in the same household. Um, so I also know that the struggles associated with that. And, uh, you know, we're privileged enough, my family, to even accommodate that. Um, I, I think that our society has, you know, deconstructed the family so much so that we become reliant upon these type of like external uh, things to help us raise our children. Um, and so the fact that, you know, children need to go to school and that's part of that social socialization process, I think that's healthy. Um, but there's always going to be concern at the back of, of my mind. Um, I do chop it up to other concerns um, as a parent. Um, you know, in Philadelphia, as soon as your child hits middle school, they take in public trains. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of risk factors and a lot of trust that we put in folks' hands um, when we're not around. Um, and when it comes to the school year coming up, you know, I, I, I'm thankful that we're in Philadelphia, which will have, you know, a, a a robust testing regime. I think the school board just said that last night for uh, you know all the students in Philadelphia um, and also teachers. Um, and also, you know, we're not having that mask issue like they're having in Florida right now. Um, so overall, like I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I can't imagine them shutting things down again. I think the die has been cast, and uh, we might have to be living with this thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I actually. Um had an opportunity, I hadn't done it in a while, to go to the school district last week um, during the hearing. And, and I talked about that, how it's very important that all this money that's coming down to all the school districts, but specifically for, for Philadelphia School District, that the money be used properly, that it not be wasteful spending, that the money is used to make sure that testing happens. Um, and I appreciate that there is now going to be a mandate for all the adults in the buildings to be vaccinated. Because I think that's one step. Because what we don't, what we don't want to happen is for a child to go to school and because an adult was not vaccinated while in school, which is the place that our children are in, the, the largest part of their day, end up getting, getting this disease and then end up being sick and ill because the child is too young to be vaccinated um end up being hospitalized and, and you know something possibly worse even happening after that yeah. that 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 you know when i was I, I didn't share this with you but i was a secretary at my children's school last year so i got to see firsthand um the protocols the the cleanliness um the disinfecting that was happening and my hope is that this is going on across every school in the district um all those you know the, the custodial staff is short. They did everything possible to make sure that the school was as clean as possible, but it also takes working in conjunction with 
the all the adults in the building as well as the, the adults that carry the little people to the screen so my hope is that anyone watching is that you please share this conversation because it's very important that every adult that's a part of this keep the children safe that's our biggest concern of course keep ourselves safe but also keep our children safe so let so let's talk a little bit about um the teach truth campaign um i had the opportunity to speak with tamara we talked about it and it's she told me something that touched me that she said that at one of the previous actions there were teachers that were really um brought i don't know if they were brought to tears but they were very emotional to see parents in solidarity with what they were doing so can you talk, how does that make you feel when you know that there are parents out there that are supportive of you teaching the truth to students? Well, I, I, no, I was at that rally uh, tomorrow we were referring to, and I was uh, humbled and honored enough to even be able to uh, share a couple words there. Um, but for the most part, I think it's for all people within this society. I think, you know, you don't have to have eyes to recognize sunshine, you know what I mean? And for a lot of folks, it's really just not being exposed to certain ideas or the histories that have actually made the reality in which we exist in today. So as soon as parents know that and start to like recognize those patterns, there ain't no going back. Um, it's easier to ignore it when you know how have, have idea how it operates. But when you start to recognize patterns on how this society and how the system operates, you start to like, wait a minute, I can't ignore that anymore. In actuality, it makes me extremely upset. And I think it was James Baldwin who said, you know, to be a Negro in America and relatively conscious means to be enraged all the time. And that rage is derived, you know, derived from the reality of, you know, we're told one thing and they go ahead and do another. And it's a constant kind of like trying to keep up while at the same time trying to prove. Um, I'm hoping, you know, as past generations have done before, reject those ideas, but that's only going to happen if we're able to teach the truth to our children in the school buildings. And I think that, you know, our enemies and the folks that are attacking the, uh, our right to do this uh, know that. They know that even their children, when they learn the truth about history, might have to start like looking at their parents' little side eye. <laughs> and, and they know that, you know. Um, when all this was happening, uh, when it first happened, I was still teaching. I left the classroom in, around February. Um, and, you know, I broached the subject with my, my students and I emphasized the fact that even something like symbolic, like em empty symbolism of Colin Kaepernick taking a knee caused that man to be banned from the NFL and blacklisted, right? And that was just empty symbolism. So when we're mm -hmm. talking about being able to make sure that the truth is put in front of students about, you know, the nature of the society, how it was built off of, you know, the enslavement of Africans after the genocide of indigenous folks in order to maximize profits. We have to understand that our children have to understand that in order for their eyes to be wide, wide open when transversing within the society. If not, we're throwing them out in the dark. You know, there's children graduating high school, hopefully can read, but don't even know that the name of our economic system is capitalism. You ask a 17 year old what capitalism is, they start talking, oh, that's our, that's our government system or what's our government system, you know? And this confusion, it's like, okay, go fix that car, but the person never seen a car before. Exactly. And that's what and that's, we're doing to our children. And they don't even, a lot of children, unless, unless their parents were purposeful, do not even understand the election process. Yep. They, they haven't had the privilege in their school to be taught civics. So it's being left on a lot of outside factors to educate our children. When unfortunately there was a disconnect of, I don't know how, how, how many decades it stopped because I had, I don't know how old you are, but I'm probably older than you, but I'm 50. I had civics in school. I had civics in high school. Um, and, but I knew about it beforehand because my mom, um, not being from this country, as soon as she became a citizen, that was back in the mid, early to mid eighties, she said, I want to make sure I participate in the vote because now I have a right to do so in this country. A lot of families are still dealing with that, coming from another country, waiting the years that it takes to become, 
you know, a naturalized citizen and then being able to vote. But my, my thing is, my concern, and a lot of people concerned, and I'm quite sure yours as well, is the apathy for people that were born here when it comes to voting, not only in the national elections, but the local ones. So we're left with not only having to teach our children about real history, world history, to make them global citizens, but also in, in, you know, make sure we plant that seed of, of knowledge as far as the importance of using your, your birthright to vote and vote intelligently. So the fact that there are people out there that are trying to keep educators from teaching children, and I love this, I love, I'm gonna paraphrase this, but some that Kaziah Ridgway, which I'm quite sure you know, yeah. she was in an interview and she stated, the fear that people have when ch with children being taught to think critically is that they're gonna grow to be critical voters. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what it is. They do not want our children to have enough forethought to say, hey, this person is out here wanting my vote. Why should I give it to them? Why can I question them? What question would I say to them? How can I prepare myself to approach them? Yeah, and, and, and you know, to veg back off of that in regards to education, I'm actually reading a book. I just actually finished it. It's called The White Architects of Black Education, Ideology mm -hmm. and Power, 1865 until 1950. And in the book, it talks about after, you know, during Reconstruction and after that, how racist financiers financed and also directed Black education in the United States. And the whole goal was a compliant workforce that wouldn't, that knows their place within society and that holds, you know, the racial division that existed at that time in place. So like, and, and the goal, and, and racist Southern whites co-signed putting money towards black education and black universities if they did those things of focusing just on industrial skills and not on liberal education. Now, as a result of that, that's why you have Hampton University as the first uh, HBCU. That was an industrial university founded by a white man named Samuel Armstrong, who was a, an adjunct racist. You know, but if we don't know this history, how do we know what education actually is? What is the purpose of education? What are we changing? What are we, uh, 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 you know, preparing our children for? And what are we expecting them to be? You know, and I feel like, you know, and I think you were alluding to this, like we haven't really kind of figured it out. Like there is in the past, right? There has always been a tradition of black educators in black schools, like being uh, like uh, uh, the, the recent book that just came out, Fugitives in the Classroom, teaching what they're not supposed to teach to the kids, right? That's always been in place. But at the same time, there was always this force that kept teachers in their place and felt like black children had no right to know this stuff. And also if they did know this stuff, that they're a danger. They mm -hmm. want a compliant workforce who will go along to get along and that will co-sign both major political corporate parties that now run our society today. Mm -mm -mm. And, this, and this is why it's very important for people to speak out. Yeah. This is why it's so important for families that have school-aged children to come out and support this weekend. I already indicated in the notes, the link is in the chat, folks. I put it on there, you click on that link, it'll give you, there's, it's, four, it's happening in 43 places right now. There may be more between now and Friday, but there are 43 different communities across the country where a place has been designated, a time has been set. All you have to do is show up and so be supportive of those educators. Because I, I, what, I what I don't, and, and when Tamara was telling me that there are actually people that are afraid of losing their jobs, of being sanctioned, of being fined. I don't know if imprisonment is part of that as well, but to just teach the truth, the, you know, not the, not the watered down version, not the whitewashed version, the entire truth of, of how this country was formed, of other cultures across the world. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough, you know, in my upbringing that, that my mother, uh, although she only had a fourth grade education, she made sure my sister and I uh, dove into everything when it comes to knowing ourselves. So she helped us, and, you know, and then, but then on the, on the other side of that, 
the most racist person I knew was my father. Mm -hmm. So I got to see both sides of it. They weren't together. So in my formative years, my mom was on one side supporting me. But whenever I saw my dad every single weekend, he was always saying things. And I would look at him like he was crazy. And he would say, you know, he would say things and derogatory things and very racist things. And I'm like, why don't you say that in English? And he would, but he wouldn't do it. So me being me, whenever I was around other people, let someone say something about someone I was with that they couldn't understand. Oh, Maritza was like, oh, you know what she said about you? Mm-hmm. So, and I said, I said, if, if you're bold enough to say what you need to say in another language, be bold enough to say it in a language that everyone understands. And what's happening now in comparison is that people in power do not want our children to understand that language and be able to decipher the nonsense and just be spoon, spoon fed the history they want them, they want them to know and understand. And even the connection, even yes. the in this connection that you're referring to. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm not glad, I'm, 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 I'm happy that you brought up your experience with your father in that regard, because, you know, my mother being, uh, was from uh, England, but she was black. And my father, uh, father is Dominican and his mother is Puerto Rican. Mm. But when my, my father married my mother, his parents did not talk to him for five years because he married a black woman. When my mm -hmm. Puerto Rican grandmother died, she left money to all the great grandkids except my kids because my wife is black. And so when, when you look at that, that is so embedded with that anti-blackness is so embedded within cultures. And I'll even say, say it to people, uh, to students I used to have who were Latino and they would call themselves Spanish. And be like, oh, you're from Spain? Do you know anybody from Spain? You know, oh. and, and I'll, point, I'll point to a kid in a classroom and I'll be like, is he British? Cause he speaks English, you know? So like this cultural aspect, we also have to acknowledge that, you know a lot of the Spanish identities are extensions of white supremacy with a different language. And, you know, and it's just as insidious, if not more insidious, because we got a bunch of folks walking around brown skin with those same anti-Black ideas, while mm -hmm. at the same time walking around like, we color brown around here. And it's, and it's, it's so insidious. So like in this country now with Latinos making what, close to 20%, they're saying the last census. That's yes. huge. Black people in America have never gotten that high since like, the height of you know enslavement. So with Latinos increasing, you're you're starting to see the phenomenon uh, of some of them becoming racially white, and 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 I always bring this up because it's important to recognize that because that anti-blackness is a prerequisite to become white in this society, right? The Irish and Italians, one of the first English words they oh not the Irish but the Italians when they first came off the boat, the first English word they learned was the N word because they mm. know they weren't like them right? We're like you. And they were able to culturally assimilate into America after one generation, right? So you're starting to see this phenomenon starting to happen with some Latino folks who, in the census of 2000, 50% of them marked off that they were racially white, mm. ethnically Hispanic, but racially white. And I bet you by 2050, the percentage of people who, uh, who identify as white will actually be higher then than it is now because of this phenomenon, if we don't really start taking the action and start taking the initiative and teach all children the truth, because once yes. they know the truth, they see the, the interconnection, they'll see a common foe, a common enemy, and see how it's tied to a long history that has been our history that has been disrupted for the last 500 years. And that's the thing, I, I, and someone said it, and I, I cannot remember, because I'm not as good as, as y'all educators at quoting specifically, but every 10 years, it happens to be a revolution. So I see two different, I see several different revolutions taking place at the same time. The revolution with regards to, you know, making all our children literate, the revolution of making sure our children are taught the truth, but also the revolution of combating this anti-Blackness, just like you stated. And there's so many others that we can just name and take over the whole show talking about. But what I need, I need folks to understand is when I say, we are all black is because that's where we all came from. Yeah. I'm not negating the fact that I'm Dominican, but I understand the root of it. I'm not negating the fact that I'm also, my family is also Taino because yep. we all originated from that. Anybody that comes from the Caribbean Absolutely. all had Indians on their islands. You know, it wasn't until some, some colonizers came over 
whether it was from England or Spain or even Asia, traveled over and then they had they, they brought people that were darker skinned that were from Africa and everybody obviously there was some kind you know whether it was unfortunately through rape but a lot of times it was through love that people got together and created this diaspora of many different colors we're all different beautiful shades of black and the people don't understand and respect that I'm sorry for you I'm 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 done apologizing for it I mean, I saw, I saw a saying that I told my best friend, I want you to put that on a t-shirt for me. I am not going to make you comfortable. I mean, I just because what I say makes you uncomfortable. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna make you uncomfortable in your comfort comfortability. I'm tired, I'm sorry, jet lag. But I'm not gonna go ahead and be nice and sugarcoat and make folks feel nice because they're sorry. And it's not a matter of making non-black children feel bad. That's not what it's about. It's about making sure they understand that there are things in history that were done by white people to people of color that has hurt us for generations. And you need to understand it in order to make sure it doesn't keep on happening or it doesn't happen anymore. And that's what folks don't understand and they need to get that. And it's not about us wanting to take over. Yes, there are more people of color in this world than there are white people. We all know this, but a lot of people, unfortunately, in some areas of this country and of and of the world, don't 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 like that dynamic. They don't like that equation, and they want to keep their their foot on our necks. And we're done. Yep. I'm off my soapbox. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no I, 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 I mean, I I totally feel you, and and it, it becomes very difficult um, at times to even convey what you are articulating right now to folks. Because, you know, we get we get caught up in the everyday hustle, you know, um, as a parent and as an educator and as an organizer activist. You know, I want more parents involved. I wanna engage more parents in like, you know, the content that as an educator, I engage with other educators and my students with. But mm -hmm. that time and the space, you know, have to go here, have to take this kid here, have to pay the bills. You know, some, you know how many people got second jobs, right? And it, it just becomes a question of like, how do we start the process of organizing? Um, because we, we're starting at a negative place right now. Like those revolutions that you referred to, those things need to happen. Now, are we at the space right now? I, I hope we're headed there. Uh, I, you seem much more optimistic <laughs> than I am, but I, I definitely recognize that, you know, that hope, that ability of, of, of recognizing the truth regardless of someone lying to you in your face right that is something that has been passed down that we can't lose because that's what's keep that's what kept our folks alive um mm -hmm. and and parents need to be teaching them passing that wisdom off to their children and then you'd be involved in these larger conversations i know a student was learning in my class when they would come to my class and be like i saw this on tv the other day this relates to what we were talking about the other day and this is what my mom said when i said the idea to her and we were sitting there watching it that is what that's what education is and and you you said it so beautifully at the beginning right it's that 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 socialization process now unfortunately uh too much of our education system um has turned into socializing our kids and in, in, into compliance and not thinking critically um and that's what folks like us are are here to to stop the fight against and to agitate against so. absolutely because we our children are not robots our children are not you know just we're not allowing our kids to end up being part of that school to prison pipeline that's that's also something that national parents union is very very adamant about we're not going to allow or continue to allow because it's been happening unfortunately certain people to have to just educate our children to a certain point that they then do not become successful adults critical thinking adults of uh, knowledgeable voting adults children that want to say when i finish high school i have two ways i can go i can either go you know learn a trade or go to college but i'm going to understand what each will mean I'm going to be able to read at the level and understand that the level that is necessary to allow me to succeed. 
And it has to start when they're babies. I mean, it, it, it hurts. And I know you've probably seen it and any educators out there watching, it hurts to, to be in front of a student, in front of a young scholar, that, support, that the expectation is that if they come to your classroom, it's a sin for them to be two, three, maybe even four years behind in literacy. And it's like you're starting from, from, from when they should have, things that they should have learned in their, in their tender years, in, in, in kindergarten, in preschool, first, second, and third grade, that at ninth, 10th, and 11th grade, they do not understand how to read or comprehend or be able to formulate a response to a question in writing because they unfortunately had people around them that were just pushing them through grade by grade and not making sure they understood. And I say this as a person that did not know English, that I had to learn English. But once I learned English, and I'm telling you, my mom did what she ever, what she had to do. She worked two and three jobs as a person that only had a fourth grade education. And she went ahead and worked at the bingo at the parochial school she had me going to just to make sure, because for her, that would have been the best education she could have offered her daughters as a single parent. And when I, after, and they did well. I mean, I learned, they used to make us sit down and write word for word from the dictionary, from Webster's dictionary from A to Z. That's how many of us at Our Lady of Mount Carmel had to learn how to write things and how to learn definitions and how I became a spelling bee, you know, champ at the school because I love to, you know, say it, spell it, say it again, but that's how you retain things like that. But there's so many new ways and I want to commend any and all of those teachers because I know one of them is on here, Ms. Sherry Lucas Hall, that she left the regular school and now she's doing her thing on her own and she's killing it, teaching these babies how to read and being successful at it. So it's, we just have to make sure that we maintain that fire, that we keep that spark, that we are supportive of those teachers. And I don't care, you can be, you know, that word, I don't know, white ally. There are a lot of white allies out there. I mean, I met them, I've, I've had teachers like that. I've came across teachers at my children's school that, that you know, wonderful, supportive, and, and they are in the know and they want to know and they want to understand because they know they're not black or brown. They want to be there for their students. And I appreciate those educators that are white that come to educators like you, that come to parents like me and ask us, what does your child need? What does a student that is not white need for me as a white teacher? What can I do for them to help be supportive of them. That is who I also want to see this weekend during the Teach Truth campaign. I want to see them out there too, being in supportive of any teacher. That's what I want to see out there. I don't just want to see black and brown teachers out there. I also want to see all of those other white teachers that while they're in school, hey, Ms. Gertie, how you doing? We love these children. I want to see them out there as well saying that we are also in this fight. We also wanna make sure that we understand and are educated so that we can educate ourselves and our counterparts at home, our families at home, as well as be supportive of our black and brown comrades that are standing up here afraid to teach the truth. And, and you know, we gotta keep it a bean too. People aren't teaching the truth, aren't teaching the truth. Like in a way it's being attacked, like this is like some insidious plot that's happening yeah. everywhere. If anything, we fighting tooth and nail against these folks to make sure that they teach, you know? So like, don't, don't, don't come at me about some like folks coming at your kids with some stuff about teaching them to hate themselves and all this nonsense that they talking about. You know, our babies have been taught to hate ourselves. That's why if you ever seen the doll test stuff before, you know, our mm. children are taught to hate themselves before they even know how to write their names by the mm. images that are shown. You know, I even had to get on my boys with anime. I'm not knocking anime. You know, I, I don't want folks getting hate mail because of this. <laughs> but I, I, always, I always get a little upset when he puts on that anime shirt. And I'll be like, okay, so why, if it's a Japanese cartoon, do they depict themselves as being white with hair that can be, you know, in a style that can be considered like whitish, you know, European-esque. And oh, dad again, da, da. I'm like, well, you need a peep game. That's not on accident. 
right? This, this stuff is insidious and it seeps into how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive the world. So like, that's why for a lot of students, like biography is like learning about the past, learning about Malcolm's, like what? I don't care about that. Like who wants to know about that? I just trying to get paid and see like, because our children are learning these things. Yes. They are being taught. That's why I didn't go to a class all year, get an A and not learn anything. And, and it's not because, you know, something didn't go down. It's because what is being presented, what is shown doesn't fit into a whole, you know, holistic uh, aspect in their life that has relevance and meaning. And, and if we did do that, that would re, that would cause this whole thing to shake. You know what I mean? Because once people start doing that, then they start to ask those deeper questions. And, you know, last time I checked, they went out their way to destroy that when that started happening in the early 70s, when folks started, we're just picking up the pieces from those movements, right? We still got brothers and sisters, political prisoners in jail yes. for fighting for our freedom during that time period. So when we're talking about where we're picking it up today, right, we, this is like, what, 60 years after that or 50 years after that, we got to really learn from those mistakes, take what they were getting at and then develop even deeper understanding with a more clear understanding on how to transverse within this system. And I think that's the direction that we need to head in uh, when we're talking about education. That's why I know my role as social studies curriculum specialist in the school district of Philadelphia, we are rewriting all social studies curriculum, K through 12. And then we're gonna have a focus on including excluded and marginalized voices that are excluded. So like we're doing it through the indigenous folks eyes when we're talking about Western civilization. You know, we spent one quarter on Europe, not the whole year, you know, because that wasn't the only Western civilization. Exactly. So like it, it changes up the definition. So it's like, don't come at me with this stuff about like, oh, you can't teach our kids that or our kids don't know how to do this or don't know how to do that. That's not on accident. That's by design. When you start to say things like, oh, well, something's wrong with our kids or something's wrong with their culture or something's wrong with the parents. You start to slide into very, very treacherous racist waters because the assumption then becomes something's wrong with those people. What I would love for you to do, and tell, you may be doing this already, when you're discussing the, developing this type of curriculum, please have a component where parents are also included in that conversation if it's not happening already. If you want to, if you want to, uh, after this offline, we can set up a meeting and we can have an event where we can invite parents and yes. I can show them stuff, show them the curriculum and do some yes. activities. Yeah. That would be awesome because I'm going to tell you something. Even like I said, I had, I, it just took one school year for me to see how things go down in schools. Um, I've always been an active parent and I know there are many, many active parents out there, but families, unless you're actually in that school building, from the morning to the afternoon, you don't really understand what's going on. You're just getting a, a little bit of information. And that is if, that is only if, the school leader allows things to be shared. So if you are part of a school that you get all the information that you ask for, I love it. But if you're part of a school that you don't get information or you get it after the fact and parents were never part of the decision-making process of what's important for our children, that you need to question what's going on at that school. If there is not a group of parents at that school that demand and ask questions, you need to make sure you create one at that school yeah. and shake it up, break it down and start it over again. You know, at my children's school, I asked, where's the parent group? Where's the parent group? What happened? What's going on? You know, after a lot of teeth pulling, they told me what went down. What went down was not positive. And I said, okay, leave it in the past. I don't want to know who did it. I don't want to know who caused it. I don't know how much money it was. I don't care about that. Let's start from the ground up. If you need to do that at your child's school, then do it. And if you need help, we're here. And, and I think you're hitting it right on the head of redefining the terms of what we're dealing with instead of operating from the definitional operating operational terms of really a, a system and a structure that really has no interest in truly educating our children, we have to switch up the definitions. Um, so like, that's why, and I, I'm a huge advocate and this might ruffle some feather, feathers also, but Let's like do it. The, the thing, the ideas like the achievement gap, as long as we allow 
uh, uh, others to control the statistics that measure our children based off of a measure that really doesn't truly measure their ability, and we allow them to tell us that is proof that our children are unable to, we will continue to be unable to because the whole purpose of a test is to weed out those who can and those who cannot. So mm. like all these words about 100% proficiency by this date and by this date, they, it's all game because at the end of the day, if you look at these statistics or whatever that they're drawing out from, from these, I would say invalid assessments, you would actually see the, the scores actually going down over the last wow. two decades. And when we're even saying that, when we talk about this idea of the achievement gap, I think we're slowly getting back into kind of the debate of the bell curve of like, the intellectual capacity of people to be able to perform in our society, which we know back then is a racist foundation, which still is the racist foundation that exists today. So I strongly encourage that any parents in there, you have ownership somewhat of some aspects of your child's education. I know for myself, I opt out all four of my children and people mm. looked at me and I was crazy. What, what, what high school are you gonna get into? You know, in Philadelphia, it's all about like the magnet high school, right? Um, my, my, my kids still went to uh, magnet middle schools without those test scores. They will be going to high school. High schools now in Philadelphia due to the pandemic are getting rid of test scores as an indicator of going into high school. But that has been a barrier to our children getting in this places like Masterman and Central, Ooh. the best schools in the state of Pennsylvania. I and they point around and turn to those test scores and be like, that test score doesn't reflect the genius of my child. That's right. That happened to my, I mean, our, our daughter, our daughter, who is now going to be a junior at Kappa, she she used to attend um, San Sankofa Freedom Charter, and she was there. And she just said to she said, "Mom and Dad, I don't want to go there for high school." I said, "That's fine. Where do you want to go?" So she did apply to all of those magnet schools, but her her desire and her fire is to perform. So she she went ahead and and auditioned and got accepted into the two major uh, performing arts high schools in Philadelphia, which is Benjamin Rush up in the Northeast, and Kappa is in, in South Philly, and I, I know there's another Kappa in Kensington, but she, so she says it, Kappa in South Philly, mom, that's the, that's the big one. Oh yeah, no, I, I worked I worked at the Kappa in Kensington. It's so she, Kensington Kappa. Kappa, it's there you go, Kappa. Yeah, see, yeah. Th thank you. So yeah. it's, so she wasn't disappointed that she didn't get into Central or Masterman. She was more excited as she got into Benjamin Rush and Kappa. But through her own research, she says, mom, you know what? I've been looking at on social media. I've been reaching out to other existing students of both the schools and uh, the vibe at the school up in the Northeast. Um, it's not the kind of environment I wanna be in at all because I see too many, too many pe people that look like me saying that they're having issues at that school. I said, well, follow your heart, daughter. And that's and she's and she's been going to Capitol and South Philly ever since. But I say that to any family, just like you said, do not let a label of a man at school keep your child from achieving the best that they can be, as well as do not allow for educators and specifically school leaders and administrators, do not forget that the parents of your scholars have talents and experience that you have no idea about, that they are fountains of information, that you have no idea about the wisdom and knowledge that those parents have, that they can share with your school community, but because you're not communicating with your families, you don't know about them. You don't know the parents that are chefs. You don't know the parents that know how to crochet like Mama Toy that created a program that, you know, teaching young ladies and, 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 young, and young men how to crochet. Only, she, oh, I don't know if someone asked her or she volunteered it, but don't wait for families to volunteer their talents. There can be teach, you know, parents out there that teach dance, that teach drumming, that teach about music technology and engineering, that they'd be happy to come into your school if you provide a space to teach kids how to cook a meal. A lot of kids don't know how to do that because they don't bring home economics back into the schools. So all these things that are happening right now, where people say that our this generation is out here now, doesn't know how to do a budget, doesn't know how about a checkbook, doesn't know about credit, don't know how to cook, don't know how to go to a supermarket without making wasting spent, you know, wasting money, you know, on nonsense instead of something nutritious that's easy to make. Ask the families. Have a parent meeting. Can you write families? Can you write down what all your talents are? 
Do you speak a second language? Can you come in here once a, once a week for an hour to teach our kids Spanish or teach our kids Arabic or French or whatever other tap language you, you know how to speak? They, they don't know. The treasures that they have in their schools are also coming from the families of the children that attend those schools, but they have to work in unison. And, and, and we got like, we got a peep game, man, because the divide and conquer, that stuff is real. So like, like, and before and hope, and thankfully this is starting to dissipate a little bit, but the charter versus public school parent thing, yo, like, you don't think those things was used against each other? <laughs> you know what I mean? We need to really unite. And regardless of where your child goes to school, whether Catholic, charter, public, private, we need to make sure that that child's learning the, the real truth about what it is and where they're living. And I Absolutely. don't care. Like it, there should not be any de debate about this, that, or the other, because at the end of the day, folks are just trying to do what's necessary for their child. And also a lot of folks that talk that trash about it, they'll move to the suburbs anyway and send their children out there. So like my mentality is do what you need to do for the best situation for the education of your child. And let's start getting our alignment straight and not allowing outsiders to define the battle that we're fighting because the battle that we're fighting isn't to like get rid of more educational opportunities for our children. The battle that we're fighting is that to get our children educated. And Absolutely. it isn't just sitting next to a white child at a school because obviously that's not going to, it's about, uh, it's about being able to be able to be situated to understand uh, and have the opportunities uh, necessary to navigate and survive. Mm, you should, I, I don't know if you're looking at the comments, but it, it, they lit up. The comments are lit up. So, I'm, you know, I see everybody's comments and I appreciate you, but I, there was one comment that I see that I actually, um, I understand what you said about, you know, those throwaway assessments, but at some level, I think it is needed just so we can know where our children are. Oh yeah. So, you know, that, I'm not that much, that. yeah, that, that much I do, I do feel is needed so that we can know where the children are. That's why I think, and it was something that I don't think it was something new and, you know, it was something new that just came out this year, but I really appreciated when the, when the school leader from my children's school said prior to the end of the last school year, she tasked her teachers with something. And I appreciated that when I heard that. That's why I have so much respect for her. Shout out to Mary McLeod Bethune Elementary, Principal Bradley. Bradley. Yes. Yeah. Shout out That's to her. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I don't care. I'm going to shout it out. That's my baby school. That's my school principal. She's great. But when she told the teachers what I want you to do, we need an ILP, an individual learning plan for each and every single student. So she tasked those teachers, said, I need you to sit down and write out for each and every one of your existing students where they are. And when you do that, share it with the teacher, share it so they can then go to the next teacher they're going to have for the following school year. Yep. That way that new teacher will understand that child and know what level that child is coming in on. Yeah. And, and see, that's a better thing. And they do that uh, at SLA. Um, mm. in the city they have for a uh, journal report card conferences they have narrative report cards uh where the teacher is actually writing out a narrative of the child's progress not just on one indicator and i think that's that's where my my upsetness where one indicator is used to tell me that my my child is able to do something in the future or not and the number one indicator if a child does well on those standardized tests is social economic status so the more it doesn't matter race, it doesn't matter if both parents are at home, nothing. Literally, social economic status. So, like as long as you know they socially economically segregate folks, we're going to continue pulling these numbers out in certain places and hitting walls when we get to it, if we allow that to become the only sole uh, indicator. Uh, I, certain things I've saw in schools of like how many like how many students of uh, different race are failing in the class. Is there a pattern that you can find? Is there a teacher that seems to be failing the most? You know, students of color. You know, there's certain ways you can look at other parts of data that would actually get down to the heart. And then I'm a huge advocate of portfolios and even drawing out a narrative to get a full picture of a child's like interest capabilities and also give them the opportunity to explore those. 
Um, but the, to, pe the, the piece that I added to that when they were having that Zoom conversation, because being a part of staff, I was also in on that Zoom call. I was like, excuse me, where is the question for the parents? Mm. Make sure the parent is asked, where do you see your child right now? How successful do you think they have been? What level do you think your child is at right now with their learning with each individual subject? So that that can be used in conjunction with what the teacher stated. So that new teacher can say, okay, this parents have to be part of that too. Oh yeah. Cause the best teacher is the parent. We understand that child the most. So, and, and, and you know, oh my gosh, we go, you're gonna be on my show again, just so you know. Yes, yes. But, cause they only give me till five o'clock. So we got five minutes. So I want you to tell me, I didn't get to touch upon the social emotional piece of mm. these children coming back in. How have you prepared yourself for those emotions that are going to be coming back to the classroom? Well, um, I, well, well how I was, have you prepared other folks? Yeah, how, yeah, how, I was about what to say. advice, what advice then would you give to these teachers that are, you know, not only mentally preparing themselves to once again, have 20 to 30 children in the classroom, but now dealing with a full year and a half of, of isolation of not a lot of socializing, what advice would you give to a teacher that's in a classroom? Um, be honest. Uh, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. If you expect students to be vulnerable with you, you need to be vulnerable with the students. Um, they smell blood in the water. So if you fake the funk, you will get bitten. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I would also say that I also recognize what's happening in the world right now. Um, our, our, our children are being exposed uh, to concepts and ideas, even through memes um, that, you know, past generations like 10 years ago weren't exposed to. So keep that in mind. They're fully aware of what happened January 6th. Um, they're fully aware about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and, 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 and lean into it. And, and don't be afraid to introduce these to younger children also, because they also need to learn this. Um, I, I would also uh, emphasize that the pandemic it exposed stuff that was already there, but made it much, much more clear and sharper, right? We, we all feel it in our bones right now. We're living through some specialized times um, and the students feel that too. And it's okay to acknowledge that, admit that, recognize that it's not all good and that we need, we, there's a lot of hard work ahead um, and inoculate them prepare them for the world that's going to be in front of them because you know we need to be honest it, it, it isn't going to it's not headed in a better direction um, yes. and they're going to have to prepare themselves uh, psychologically um, you know mental you know that's psychologically psychologically emotionally all that um, in order to survive whatever storms around the horizon but then at the same time prepare themselves to build something new when that time comes oh my goodness I'm so happy I talked to you today. I'm so happy you had to, you gave me some time today. You gave us some time today. My one last bit of advice for educators, take the time to have a chat with the parents. Don't just wait until back to school night. Don't just wait till report conference time. Send a text or an email, leave a voicemail message, ask that parent or guardian, can we have some time to talk? And then when you're talking to them, ask them, hey, I want to be able to have a fluid way of communicating with you. What is your best method of communication? Are you a texter? Do you prefer email? Do you want to do Zoom calls? All of our children got a Chromebook. We don't know when we're going to see each other in person. Take that baby's Chromebook and set up a call with that parent. Do that. Create, establish that respectful relationship so that then it can help your child to have a successful school year. That's my last bit of advice to, to, to teachers, to parents too. If a teacher doesn't ask you for that, teach parent, ask the teacher for that. Say, I'd like to have a 15, I know you're busy as a teacher. Can I have 15 minutes of your time? so that we could get to know each other and we can have good communication this school year and beyond. Mr. Jimenez, thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
No problem. It's my pleasure. Oh my gosh. Have a great rest of the week. And we will talk. We're going to talk after this. We absolutely will. Families, thank you so much. I'm going to cut it today. All the information is in, is in the chat for the links for everything that's happened. Teach Truth Action weekend this weekend. Support your educators. Please come out there. Join the National Parents Union. Go on the Northeast Facebook page. If you live in the Northeast, join the page. Be part of our virtual meetup coming September 9th. Enjoy the rest of your week, everybody. Be safe. Thank you.